Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, meeting of the uh, Pitt County Board of Health. First item on the agenda is to request any public comments. Are there any comments from the public at large tonight? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to approval of the minutes of the uh, June meeting. Uh, those have been distributed in advance. Uh, are there any corrections or additions to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, is there most approved? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the minutes are approved. Let's move on to the uh, fiscal report. Marsha Hall. Marsha Hall. There we go. Um, so we, July 1, we started our fiscal year 2019, and this is our first month, and I know you're used to this uh, report, but the first column is what was approved by the Board of Commissioners. Uh, we're looking at 11.4 11.4 million um, we've been working with the county office to realign some of our accounts associated with grants um, outside of state funding so you will see that in the second column there is a minus of 67,406 and that is due to a vital um, in-home breastfeeding grant that we are moving is just moving account numbers um, we still have the funding it is just basically uh, working in munis the accounting software um, which decreases the budget in munis but it will be a grant so next fiscal year the money will roll over and you will not have to, we will not have to project um, revenues um, the fourth column is the pro rata in a perfect world um, if everything came in as one one month out of the 12 months um, our year to date is uh, pretty okay uh, we do have the timing issues of seven hundred seven thousand um, dollars our year to date adjusted we are looking at a 218,000 surplus are there any questions Okay, does anybody have any questions? How about from the audience, any questions about the budget? Fiscal report? Okay, uh, we need to approve this. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Is there a second? second? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the report's approved. <clears throat> do you want to go ahead with the uh, fiscal, the ending? Yes, sir. 17, 18. I can do that. Okay. Um, and before I get started with that, I just wanted to um, talk about, we just filed this week the 2017 Medicaid cost study, which was a very um, lengthy uh, educational process for myself and my team. Um, we actually have myself and three members of the admin, admin team traveling to New Bern next week to actually learn about Medicaid cost reform and the changes um, involving the 2018 Medicaid cost report. Um, as the admin division, we actually have 17 vacant positions, all in different um, aspects. Some are being advertised, some are closing, some are actually in, between, um, in the process of being offered positions. Um, and at Public Health, we actually have quite a few building improvements going on. We are um, painting some walls, removing some wallpaper, and installing new carpet as of September the 10th. And we'd like to um, say thanks to Buildings and Grounds for overseeing lots of the projects. Um, and if I could get your attention for the closing report for fiscal year 2018, uh, revenues actual versus budgeted, environmental health actually came in at 23,781 more than what was anticipated. So did our Medicaid fees. Our clinic fees were a little bit off, um, minus 8,480, but with EPIC being launched in April and all of the training that was involved, uh, we did have a couple of days where staff had to go off site to train. That is actually, I think, remarkably well. Um, what was projected for grants and contributions that we received were, was less than projected. We received 532,000, but we did budget more than that. Um, our fund balance as of June 30th, 2018 is $1.128 That does include the purchase of the EPIC electronic medical rec 
record system, and it also includes our Medicaid settlement that um, from 2013 that we were responsible to pay them back. Th these numbers may change a little bit because of preliminary reporting because the annual auditors are here at the county office right now. So, lots of questions. All right, questions for Marsha? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, that's just an information item this time, yeah. so, okay. All right, we'll move on to uh, the next item on the agenda is amendment of the mobile home park rule. Uh, this was discussed at the previous meeting and then we had to have a uh, public uh, hearing about that or at least an announcement to the public. Uh, did any comments come in from the outside? Did not receive any. Okay. All right. So, um, this is up to, uh, we need to go ahead and approve this tonight then, so. If you're ready to. All right. Do you have any questions from the last uh, last meeting about this? Or? Okay. All right, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All right, any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, rules approved. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, and then we'll move on to environmental health staffing. There we go. Can't hear. Okay. Yeah, we'll pull that up, okay, Kent? Yep, I got it. Good evening. Um, my name's Kent Keeter. I'm the um, environmental health uh, supervisor for the on site wastewater section. Um, it's been a while since I've spoken with you guys. Um, just a little bit about us an overview. Uh, there's uh, six total employees, including myself. I have three environmental health specialists and two program specialists that overlook individual programs within, um, within uh, the on-site wastewater section. Um, some of the things that we oversee, uh, you may be aware of, um, we have several um, state-mandated programs that we have to, that we're required by law uh, to oversee, the on-site wastewater section, the private drinking uh, water well program, the public swimming pool program, the Tattoo Artist Inspection Program, and the Migrant Housing pre occupancy Program. Um, tonight, I'm specifically talking about on-site wastewater and uh, not really going to get into the other stuff, um, the staffing. Uh, just sort of a, a timeline of the o uh, overview of what um, we're looking at. In 2007, uh, we began the Private Wells Program. So there was some additional uh, workload placed upon us. Um, in 2008, as a part of our uh, accreditation uh, corrective action, we, were, we began doing 3B pump system inspection program. Um, in 2011, it was kind of a low point in the economy. Uh, we, um, in, our, in the next slide, you'll see um, our number of lot evaluations and activities went way down uh, to 201 lot evaluations and 235 um, on-site wastewater activities. Um, Directly after that, in 2012, we began overseeing the public swimming pool and tattoo programs. Part of that was just to kind of make up the gap for the, the loss in work from the on-site wastewater program. Um, and here we are kind of today, the la um, last year's numbers. We're back up to uh, 590 lot evaluations in 2017 and 763 on-site wastewater um, activities. And I'm gonna put a, a slide up. Uh, back in 2007, we had uh, seven uh, field staff and one supervisor. And you can kind of see as the economy went south, um, so did our numbers. Uh, we lost two staff members in 2011 um, through attrition. Um, they uh, moved on and those, pl those positions were not filled. Uh, directly after that, the remaining, the, as you can see, our numbers started climbing again. And, now uh, we are at a higher rate of uh, activities than we were when we had the seven uh, total staff members. And, and any questions about that? So I was asked to uh, look at response times for um, on-site wastewater permitting. And that's a very difficult thing to do. There's a whole lot of factors involved with that. Um, uh, do I look at the initial time to respond? Do I, do I look at the time until the evaluation? Do I look at the project completion? And the 
part of the problem with that is there's a huge amount of variability that we can't control. If I were to um, uh, someone come into our office and make an application for for permit, um, we would call them up and set an appointment. And it, it happens we'll call someone and say well, we'd like to you know go ahead and make an appointment to do a lot of evaluation. I said well I'm I'm going on vacation for three weeks. Uh, I'll be available after that time. So is our wait time three weeks because they're not ready for three weeks. Uh, sometimes in a subdivision scenario, they'll come in and they'll make a, a, you know, 30, 40, 50 lot um, applications for a subdivision. And they may not, they may be months before they have the, the, the site ready for us to evaluate. So I really can't look at time until we're, we, we actually get <coughs> on site. So what I looked at specifically was the time that we responded to that applicant coming into our office. You know, we, we, we make a phone call and we say, hey, this is our first, the, the first response we've had to them, and we'll get there based off of that. Um, so this, my data is, and that's something I could track based off of um, uh, the uh, quality assurance for all the permits I bring in. I, I, I track this time on every permit that we bring in, and I'm gonna bring some slides up. It's gonna look a little weird. Um, um, basically, I, I base it off of work days. I, I don't count weekends. Back in 2015, it was uh, right around two days average for uh, new existing uh, and repairs wells. Uh, when someone would call in, when someone would come in for an application, we would we would be in, in contact with them within two days, and we would try to, as quickly as possible, schedule uh, you know, a meeting with them on their property to, to do the work. Um, as you can see, we've, we're moving through time. Uh, it is almost five days now before we even, on average, before we can get uh, a response to them to set an appointment. Uh, now we do prioritize. Uh, this is an average. It, it's accumulating everything together. Uh, repairs we uh, take very seriously and we try to get to those almost immediately. Those are going to be the first thing we do. Um, uh, uh, new systems uh, are, are, are not the first thing. Uh, so, But we are averaging it all, all together here and that average uh, has over doubled in the last three years. So wait times are going up and that that is a in direct um, response to the amount of workload that we have and the number of people that we have. And uh, I'll, I'll go back one. And I track that for each individual person as well. So I know, <laughs> uh, I, I know if someone's taking a lot longer than someone else, so that can move uh, resources from one place to another to try to bring that down. So we're actively trying to keep the, the wait time as little as possible. Um, um, so here, here I put together um, wait time with the total processed um, activities. So what I did, when, when someone turns a piece of paperwork into me, I'll, I'll process that paperwork and I'll, I'll get a response time for that, and then I will log that as being a completed activity. Uh, some of these were generated, this may not match up well with our uh, number of applications made, because some of these may have been started two, three years before for projects that take a long time. Uh, but I'm logging all that in, and you can see it's upward trending you know, the, as, as the number of uh, permits are issued or going up, so is the wait time. Um, so we can see our, our work has steadily increased. Um, uh, 2018 activities are outpacing uh, 2017 activities. Uh, we're pretty close to matching them already this year, aren't we? It's uh, not too far off of matching the total 2017 already in this year, and we're not much more than halfway through with it. Um, uh, we're currently telling applicants for new lot evaluations six to eight weeks. Um, like I said, once again, we're prioritizing repairs um, on top of every, uh, you know, before these, um, we want to fix problems before we start new projects. Um, and uh, we believe that uh, these, these, if these trends continue, that that wait time uh, could, could be expected to increase. Um, I, I looked at our workload versus what each person's doing. And it's, uh, what you need to get from this is it's variable. And these are in six month segments. And in the, in the spring, our workload goes up and that's mainly because of our swimming pool program. And then uh, in, in the second half of the year, it, it, it tends to drop. And then spring comes around again, it, it pops up again because we, we have more of those activities coming in. So we've moved through, but what you need to look at here is the trend. The trend is moving upward and it's moving upward pretty quickly. Um, so uh, my staff members have pretty much reached the capacity to work with, within the bounds of what they have to do. And the only way to really 
there's no way to really get much more efficiency out of the staff without suffering with quality. And we can't have that because of the liability. We have certain things we, by law, have to do a certain way. And we can't really rush the process through without doing what's required by law. So uh, we believe that um, increased uh, wait times can inhibit growth and uh, economic development in Pitt County. Um, uh, I get a lot of calls from uh, engineers and uh, developers and builders, and they're really interested in what our wait time is. How long is it going to take me to get my project off the ground? Uh, it, it, it affects their their bottom line, their 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 interest rates, everything. So we we talk with them a lot, and they they're very concerned about the wait time, and uh, it is a. Uh, it's our belief that additional staff is needed um, to help reduce the wait time and, and to, you know, be able to continue the, the economic growth that we have. So, any questions? No? So, with, with this, um, good news is there is building going on, so that's great. Uh, absolutely, the recovery. It's a good problem to have, but unfortunately, you're, <laughs> looks like you need some more staff. Well, we're, like I said earlier, we're uh, working, we're, we're producing with five what we were doing with seven yes. uh, back in 2007. So um, my staff is stressed. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Moore, there's a letter here that we uh, drafted uh, asking, uh, requesting some changes in the salary and, and a bonus and so forth. Do we need to vote on this tonight or is this just for uh, information? This was, was drafted after your motion last month. Right. Um, so, um, or excuse me, in June at the last meeting. So um, this is this is for your uh, editing and okay, uh, w whatever way y'all like to approach it. I would like just to just to add, Kent uh, and his staff do a really great job. We've got some fantastic employees in that division. They're very experienced. You know, a lot of people still don't understand exactly the work that they do, but it's highly technical. Uh, these are very well trained staff. Uh, and, and that work has changed. Uh, that work, it keeps changing. Uh, swimming pools is just one example of, of the technical aspects of that job in terms of inspecting. Um, I know you could talk all day about that, Absolutely. Kent, but, but uh, they, these guys are having to stay on top of rules that are changing. I think some just got changed last week by the state commission that have to do with these on-site rules. Uh, we've got more changes coming with the state general assembly action recently. Um, so, it's a very challenging job, and, and they do an outstanding uh, standing job. They've been working weekends also recently. The, the, as you can see in the letter, the county manager approved for them to work overtime on the weekends to try to catch up because of these delays. But um, I think we're back to where we're going to uh, need some additional staff, and I, and I agree with, with, uh, with, the, with your staff that, that we're, we're there, that we need some more help. What happened to the two that used to be on? One left uh, to work in another county. Okay. Another was promoted from within from after retirement. And those positions were never filled. They were lost. And at the time, it was it, it was not a bad thing because of the, the, the economy and, and, and the workload. Well, it was a bad thing. Uh, anytime you have something that's going to create a bottleneck, the bottleneck in this case is training because it takes you guys about a year to come on and get up to snuff from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself speaks to the importance of the job. It would seem to me that in a downturned economy that there could be reassignments, and if those reassignments would actually uh, hurt credentials, then you could do it on a rotating basis to be able to fall back in good times, because anybody thinks that bad times are going to be here forever is greatly mistaken. So I, I don't mean to sound critical no, to no. you or any any way, but I think that there's we, we can't we can't unspill the milk necessarily, mm -hmm. but we can learn from this. And maybe this is something that the county manager and I need to have a, a talk about because I'm sure there are other positions throughout the county in different departments that fall into the same mm -hmm. kind of um, criticality, shall we say? I should re rephrase and say that we, we felt lucky that we did not have to you know, um, uh, basically get rid of people during the downturn. A lot of counties around us did. They furloughed tons of, uh, a lot, lot of environmental health specialists in the downturn. Uh, we're not there anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it seems to take longer to get the positions back than it does to, to not, not 
move forward with them. So. Always. <laughs> yeah. but I think it, it is a, a problem that we, we don't have a good answer to in terms of if the economy picks up, if building is picking up, then we, we need these staff critically, and then we hire them, and then if that economy slows down, we got to find something else to do with those staff. If I were to and, hire, and it's not just our county; it's all the counties that are undergoing the same issues across we, the state. If we were to hire someone today that did not have um, straight out of college, probably somewhere between six months to nine months before they could sign the first piece of paperwork, probably three years before they're comfortable, probably five years before they're proficient. That speaks to the criticality. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks very much for uh, going over that in great detail for us and. Uh, any questions? Sure. I well, appreciate outside. the info. Thank you. Um, I think the draft letter looks looks pretty good. Uh, if anybody has any comments, uh, just I guess let me know afterwards, and we can go ahead and get that uh, in motion. Okay. Let's see. For new business, we've got the annual state of the county health report, and is that Amy going to start out? Amy Hatton. Good evening. I'm really pleased to be able to present in the report in its entirety. I know last um, last meeting we gave you a, a brief version of what's in the report, but tonight we're going to go in depth and um, share some stats with you and let you know exactly where we are with this year's, or actually the 2017 State of the County Health Report. We do have several presenters tonight. Um, they'll each introduce themselves as they come up, but we're real pleased to have our uh, Vidant partners with us tonight. We have Pitt Partners for Health, which is represented through uh, Vidant Medical Center Community Health Programs, as well as the Vidant Health Foundation that funds a lot of the initiatives that you have already seen within the report. You do have copies of the report in front of you tonight. Um, for our uh, community members that are viewing tonight, they can go online to our um, health department website and receive the same copy uh, in online version. It's also as part of tonight's report, we will have our annual communicable disease report. So each person that's presenting that will also introduce themselves as they come forward. So to give you some background information about the SOTS report, it is prepared annually and it's linked to our com county's community health needs assessment. The community health needs assessment, or the CHNA that we call it for short, is a requirement of both not-for-profit hospitals as well as local health departments in order to assess the needs of our community. In Pitt County, the CHNA is a partnership between our health department our hospital, Pitt Partners for Health, and East Carolina University. The next joint assessment completion is scheduled for the spring of 2019, and you'll be hearing more about that in a future presentation. So the SOTS report contains the most recent, recent secondary data, such as our leading causes of death, and it also contains annual updates on activities that have been implemented to meet the CHNA health priority goals. So secondary and primary data drive our work. So we're going to share some of that with you tonight. So the first is the leading causes of death in Pitt County. This is just for 2016 as well as for North Carolina. As you see, the leading cause of death in 2016 in Pitt County was heart disease followed by cancer. Now this is a flip-flop from the two years previously. Two years previously, cancer was the leading cause of death. Now heart disease has taken that number one slot. So the third leading cause is stroke. The fourth would be all other unintentional injuries. So that does not include motor vehicle accidents. Alzheimer's disease is fifth. Sixth is chronic lower respiratory diseases or COPD. Seventh is diabetes. Eighth is motor vehicle injuries. Ninth is septicemia. And then the last is kidney diseases and other related disorders. I am pleased to say that Pitt County was lower than North Carolina for all of the leading causes of death in 2016. However, heart disease and Alzheimer's disease did rise from 2015, but we still remain lower 
in all those categories from the state. This next graph I wanted to point out to you how some of the diseases have changed rank over the last few years since 2013. And if you look at number four, where you see in blue chronic lower respiratory disease, you'll see that for 13, 14, and 15, that was ranked at number four. But if you look in 2016, that dropped to the sixth ranking. We hope that that may be due to a lot of the policy and environmental changes that we have in place. Um, maybe even smoke-free restaurants and bars law that was put into place about eight years ago, um, helping you know, with people with respiratory illnesses. And also tobacco-free parks, which we'll hear a little bit more about later on in our presentation, but we're hoping that that has um, contributed to that decline. You'll also notice that um, and number four for the all other unintentional injuries, that is risen to number four. If you look in 13, 14, and 15, in 13, and this is in the pink, um, in 13 it was number six, then it rose to number five in 14 and 15, and now it's number four. We suspect that probably has to do with opioid use, abuse, overdoses, and, and deaths from the opioid abuse. Um, because it does continue to rise. Also, if you notice in the yellow, diabetes was number five in 2013. And for the last three years, 14, 15, and 16, it's dropped to number seven. And we hope that that is attributed to the numerous diabetes prevention programs that we have in place as part of our chronic disease prevention program, um, helping diabetes to continue to lower. And we hope that eventually it will not even be in the top 10 if these programs can continue. We have a lot of grants that are supporting that. And then another one I wanted to point out to you was Alzheimer's. If you notice, it was number seven in 13, um, and this is in the green. It rose to number six in 14 and 15, and then number um, five in 2016. So it's continuing to get worse. So just giving you a picture of, of where we are with a few of those leading causes of death. As far as cancer, and this is from the North Carolina Central Cancer Registry, these are projected new cancer cases and deaths for selected sites. So with lung cancer, projected new cases was 124, with projected deaths at 85. Female breast cancer, 154 projected new cases with 21 projected deaths. Prostate cancer, 104 projected new cases with 13 projected deaths. And then colon uh, rectal cancer, 65 projected new cases with 24 projected deaths. So additional morbidity data. Um, this comes directly from Vidant Medical Center. The top morbidity diagnoses that have resulted in inpatient hospitalization at Vidant Medical Center, this is for 2017, was uh, sepsis, kidney disease, COPD, heart disease, major depressive disorders, and stroke. So now we're going to um, lead into our health priorities. These are the health priorities that you, this board, selected um, back from our 2015 needs assessment. And there are three of them, maternal and child health, uh, tobacco, and sexually transmitted diseases with a focus on chlamydia. So I'm going to start out with maternal and child health tonight. Our uh, infant mortality prevention coordinator, Jennifer Hardy, is on vacation this week, so I'm filling in for her and will share this information with you. So the goal of this health priority area is to reduce Pitt County's infant mortality rate to at or below the state's rate, and that's based upon five-year averages, with spe special emphasis on reducing the rate among low-income African-American women, because that's where our rate is the highest. This is as much as two to three times the rate among Caucasian women. And just as a reminder to our community, infant mortality is defined as the death of a baby before his or her first birthday, so within that first year of life. So this is just showing you based on five-year averages. If you look at the um, cones on the left, you can see that even our white rate is continuing to climb slowly, but it is climbing. And you can see how the African-American non-Hispanic rate is much higher than the non-Hispanic white rate. And it might dip a little bit, but it's still not where we need to be. And although some reports show that there's a narrowing of the gap between the white and the non-white or the African-American rate, it's not a gap in a good way 
because the gap is closing because the white rate is rising. So we still have a lot of work to do. So to share some of the statistics with you for 2016, so in North Carolina, the infant death rate was 7.2 per 1,000 live births in 2016, and that represents 873 North Carolina infants that died within their first year of life. So for Pitt County, we were higher at 12.9 per 1,000 live births. This was an increase from 2015, and that represents 26 infants in Pitt County. And just a comparison, in 2015, it was 9.7 per 1,000 live births, and that was 21 infants. So rates by race, um, our white non-Hispanic rate for North Carolina in 2016 was 5 per 1,000 live births. That represents 335 infants. Pitt County was 8.7 per 1,000 live births, which represents 8 infants within Pitt County. Among our African-American non-Hispanic babies in North Carolina, it was 13.4 per 1,000 live births, representing 380 infants. And in Pitt County, you see it's much higher at 19.5 1,000 live births, representing 17 infants. Among our Hispanic babies in North Carolina, that was 6 per 1,000 live births, representing 111 infants. Pitt County, 5.8, and that was representing one infant. So other non-Hispanic, that they don't fall in any other category in North Carolina, that was 6.2 per 1,000, um, and that was 35 infants. And then in Pitt County, we did not have any other non-Hispanic infant deaths. So all that makes up that 26 infants that died in 2016. So why are our babies dying? The leading causes of death in Pitt County, prematurity, a baby that's born three or more weeks early, um, three weeks before or more before mom's due date, and then low birth weight, which is defined as less than five pounds, eight ounces, and birth defects. Those are the reasons in Pitt County why our infants um, have not survived. And most of the babies that are born prematurely never make it home from the hospital. They're born very, very early, and they never, ever come home. We do continue to do a lot of work um, through the Pitt Infant Mortality Prevention Advisory Council is continue to direct our infant mortality reduction strategies in the community. And as a reminder, PINPAC is the oldest active infant mortality prevention advisory council in North Carolina. It's 30 years old. So it's been going strong for a long time. Just a few of the subcommittees uh, that makes up PINPAC. There's an adolescent reproductive health subcommittee, and these committees have just been restructured recently. Um, we're, we're always analyzing to see how we need to change, and so PINPAC is just now restructured. We also have a breastfeeding support and promotion committee, our Healthy Beginnings Case Management and Outreach Committee, and then we have a public outreach committee which um, comprises our Maternity Fair Planning Committee. We have our Speakers Bureau. We're very active with March for Babies to try to raise money and put a face on the infant mortality problem. And then special projects, which is a lot of our grant writing or any other um, issues that we need to um, address. Just a few of the programs, and there's no time to really go into great detail about each of these programs, but all of these programs are addressing the infant mortality problem in our county. Our Better Beginnings Breastfeeding Program, which has a in-home management piece to it, home visitation piece, Child Care Health Consultant, which is helping our child care centers to stay safe and disease free. Uh, child Fatality Prevention Team, where infant and child deaths are being studied. Um, at Cribs for Kids, where we're trying to create safe sleeping environments for children that um, are dying due to um, maybe suffocation or overlay, um, trying to get kids in a um, affordable crib. Our Healthy Beginnings Program, which is a, um, an outreach program that's like a case management program for high-risk women, and then our Healthy Start Baby Love Plus Program, which is also um, a case management program for high-risk high pregnant women. And both of those programs are following mom two years postpartum or two years after they have their baby, and they're following the children for two years and making sure that they're plugged into a medical home and they are receiving up-to-date immunizations. In addition, our youth development program um, focuses on adolescent pregnancy prevention. Um, that is in the school system, and we are, um, hopefully we're delaying uh, teens from becoming pregnant. We also have, um, have had grant funding to support our long-acting reversible contraceptives, better known as LARC. 
our nurse family partnership program, which is another is a nurse visitation home um, home visitation program, where a nurse is following first time moms, and there again for two years postpartum, and then the triple P positive parenting program, another great initiative to help parents with um, parent any parenting issues. So I'm going to turn this over now to um, Allie Moser, and then each speaker will come up and introduce themselves as they present, and then I'll come back at the end and wrap up. Does anybody have any questions for Amy before she turns it over? I'm sure it's frustrating the infant mortality data, uh, considering we must have one of the higher uh, healthcare provider to population ratios, I would think, in the state. Uh, certainly, the, the bigger counties have more, you know, more doctors and providers, but considering our population here, we must have a really pretty good ratio. But mm -hmm. We do, and I think a lot of this is probably more um, the social determinants of health that yes. come into play with that more than lack of medical care in many cases. So. Absolutely, thank you. All right, good evening. Um, I'm Allie Moser, Allison, it's a long name, um, and I'm the tobacco prevention coordinator for Region 10, but I'm housed here at Pitt County Health Department. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the updates from the tobacco priority. Okay, so although historically tobacco has helped build this county, um, like uh, very other similar regions in North Carolina, um, it's still the number one cause of preventable death and disability in our county, the state, and the country. And it's a major contributor to many of the chronic and acute diseases mentioned earlier, um, such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, things like that. So the overall goals were to reduce ex exposure to secondhand smoke in Pitt County's multi-unit housing by 10% annually and eliminate tobacco products in Pitt County's community parks by 10% annually. Um, so for the first goal, to reduce exposure to secondhand smoke in Pitt County's multi-unit housing by 10%, um, we partnered, uh, partnered with public housing authority officials to provide technical assistance um, to implement smoke-free housing policies. Um, this could be signage, listening sessions, um, education sessions, things like that. Um, we also provided education to landlords, owners, managers um, about the effects of secondhand smoke. And we also did sessions with the tenants um, so they could learn a little bit more about the dangers and maybe what steps they could take if they were interested in clinic. So, Oh, let me go back real quick though. Well, I'll continue. I'll save the best for last. Um, so the second goal, increase by 10% the smoke-free or tobacco-free public places in Pitt County, um, in addition to multi-unit housing. Um, and that was because they're utilized by children and their families. Um, so we established a regional coalition um, to address and implement tobacco prevention and control strategies um, we got support from mun municipalities that have expressed interest in reducing exposure to, to tobacco in public parks and to implement them. And one of the first, the first park in Pitt County to pass a tobacco-free parks policy was Aiden. And that was this past November. Um, so we, some of the activities, it goes along with both um, housing and parks, um, providing technical assistance. Um, that We also provided technical assistance to universities and colleges to expand their tobacco-free policies. And um, we worked with PCC and ECU, um, Pitt Community College, and East Carolina University. And we also worked with different community partners um, to provide them resources and build capacity build capacity of different cessation options in the county. So some successes is all um, mandated by HUD, all public housing had to go tobacco free by this past July. Um, our public housing and other housing, like affordable housing or Section 8 um, in Pitt County um, decided to go 100%. So like Greenville Housing Authority, Farmville, Mid-East Mid Regional and Aiden, um, they all contain more than public housing, 
Um, they have different types of housing, but they decided to make all their properties smoke-free regardless of um, the rule. And that sign is in Farm Bowl, but all of the housing authorities got signs that look like this. And for our parks, um, Aiden was the first, and then shortly after Winterville followed Bethel and Grifton. And now um, we're working to get Greenville and Farmville on board too. Um, that's it, is there any questions? I had one question, um, Alan. I, I heard at this conference that people were concerned about the fact that now a lot of the vaping um, things, uh, what, whatever they're called, um, but they do contain tobacco, unlike what was originally um, the intent. Have you seen that in so the county? And E-cigarettes and vaping um, are a huge issue nationwide, really. Right. Um, because they're marketing it towards youth and making it making it look more appealing, um, doing different flavors. Most of them, if not all, contain nicotine. And so like with the public housing here and parks here, many of them included e-cigarettes in their policies. And schools also include that in their policy as well. Um, but a lot of people get it confused and don't realize that. Right, I didn't realize nicotine. there was a significant amount of nicotine in, in a lot of those products. Yeah, some of those uh, vaping products actually have much more nicotine than a cigarette. Mm -hmm. They can regulate it too and put more in there if they want, right? Mm -hmm. well, very good. Thank you very much for your report. Any other questions uh, for Allison? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So welcome Shayla Hayes back uh, after being introduced to their last meeting. So, uh. Good evening, Mr. Cha Chairman and members of the board. Um, yes, I'm Shayla Hayes and I'm the Communicable Disease um, and STD Health Educator. On this evening, I will be presenting on the sexually transmitted diseases um, priority area of the SOCH report. And our goal for this priority is to reduce Pitt County's rate of chlamydia by 10%. Chlamydia is the most commonly reported sexually transmitted disease in, North, in, the, in, excuse me, in the United States and in North Carolina. Um, and particularly amongst adolescents and young adults. This graph pictured here depicts the disparity that exists for Pitt County as it relates to newly diagnosed chlamydia rates by, by, the, by the years compared to the average rates of North Carolina as a whole. According to the 2017 HIV STD hepatitis surveillance report, Pitt County experienced a 12.7% increase in the annual number of newly diagnosed chlamydia cases from 2012 to 2016. Although North Carolina experienced a 12.7 increase as well in annual chlamydia rates, during the same reporting period, Pitt County's chlamydia rate is 88% higher than North Carolina. So there's an obvious disparity there as this graph shows. Um, it should be noted that chlamydia case reports represent individuals who have had a laboratory test to confirm a chlamydial infection, and therefore it is likely that this rate increase is due to an increase in the number of tests performed rather than an increase in disease prevalence. However, there's still a, a major disparity that exists there. Moving forward, I want to discuss some of the interventions that have been put in place um, to reduce Pitt County's STD rates. Um, and the first one is the Youth Development Program. This program is implemented in uh, Pitt County middle and high schools, and it serves at-risk youth and helps them with goal setting and linking them with services related to pregnancy prevention. Um, and this program does focus on pregnancy and STD prevention education. The next intervention or strategy to um, help us to reach our goal was to hire the Communicable Disease Coordinator. Um, 
which is me. Um, and since I've been in place, um, I started in May of this year, I've been working to implement programs and interventions that will hopefully contribute to um, the decline in the rate of chlamydia specifically here in the county. Um, I'm working to establish condom distribution network um, with different sites and locations around the county such as barber and beauty shops um, and hoping that that will increase the accessibility, availability, and acceptability of condom use here in Pitt County. So I'm currently working to recruit sites um, around the county um, and making condoms readily available to citizens of the county. When you look at research, condom distribution has proven to increase condom use and prevent HIV and sexually transmitted infections. So I'm hoping that this program will be a success for us. I've also been looking at two evidence-based interventions recommended by the CDC. The first one that we are thinking about implementing is Sister to Sister. Sister to Sister is a 20-minute one-on-one skill-based HIV and sexually transmitted disease risk reduction behavioral intervention. And it's for sexually active women ages 18 to 45 years old. Um, this intervention is delivered during the course of their routine medical visit. Um, and we are um, currently having discussions about implementing this intervention um, through our STD clinic at the health department. Um, the purpose of Sisters to Sister is to provide intensive, culturally sensitive health information to empower and educate women. To help women understand the various behaviors that put them at risk for HIV and other STDs and to enhance women's knowledge beliefs and confidence and skills to help reduce their skill their risk for STDs excuse me this will be achieved through teaching demonstrating and practicing negotiation skills correcting condom use demonstrations using models I'm sorry correct condom use demonstration demonstrations using models bolstering outcome expectancies regarding condom use such as sexual pleasure partner reaction and prevention um, and research indicates that um, this skill building intervention has reduced HIV risk associated sexual behaviors amongst participants, reduced frequency in sexual intercourse, um, reduced frequency of sexual intercourse, excuse me, reduced unprotected sexual intercour intercourse, fewer sexual partners, and participants reported using condoms more often. So the research does support that this could be a very effective intervention for us at the Pitt County Health Department. Second intervention that we are looking to implement is VOICES. This stands for Video Opportunities for Innovative Condom Education and Safer Sex. Um, it is a group level, single session, video-based HIV and STD prevention intervention. Um, and is designed to increase condom neg negotiation skills and increase condom use among participants. The core elements of that intervention are viewing of culturally specific videos portraying condom negotiation, conducting group skill building sessions to work on over overcoming barriers to condom use, educating program participants about different types of condoms and their features, and distributing samples of condoms identified by participants as best meeting their needs. Um, and research results about the voices intervention um, reveals that participants increase their knowledge about the transmission of STDs, have a more realistic assessment of their personal risk, and have a greater likelihood of getting condoms and intending to use them regularly. They also present fewer repeated STD infections. Mr. Chairman, um, in the last Board of Health meeting that I attended, we discussed surveying the community to find out about what ideas they had for reducing STD rates in our county. Um, do I have the approval of the board to move forward with that? I would say so. Yeah. Uh, yes, do we need a motion or just a consensus approval? I guess. Consensus is fine. Consensus approval is fine. Does anybody have any comments or? Objections or okay. <clears throat> we certainly have our endorsement to uh, to move forward. Um, and then there was some there was discussion about requesting citizen input into yes, the. Uh, uh, should folks contact you through the main number if they have uh, comments? I, or? I believe that's going to be an online survey online. that's going to okay. be administered. I don't know if we'll be putting the link out via Facebook, um, and our website, the health department's website as well. Okay.
Thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> This will be the annual communicable disease report. Yes. Next. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Lee Cutler and I'm the communicable disease supervisor and the TB or tuberculosis coordinator at the Pitt County Health Department. So this evening, my colleagues and I will update you on what has occurred in Pitt County's communicable disease world for the year 2017. Um, because communicable diseases can become a public health issue if left unattended, the local health department has been granted the authority to perform certain functions based on North Carolina General Statutes, Chapter 130A, Article 6, and this has given us the obligation to report communicable diseases. It has um, given us the responsibility to investigate communicable diseases and issue control measures. And it's also given us the ability to exercise um, quarantine and isolation authority if need be. The communicable disease program objectives um, are to control the transmission of communicable, communicable diseases with appropriate prevention and treatment. Uh, it's also to help to detect cases of communicable diseases in the community, as well as monitoring the trends of communicable diseases. The communicable disease services at the health department are including surveillance for reportable general communicable diseases, as well as sexually transmitted diseases, and that's done via either the paper-based reporting system or through our North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System, uh, which is otherwise known as NEDS. And it also includes the prompt investigation of any communicable disease cases, whether probable, suspected, or confirmed cases, as well as outbreaks. Other services include the implementation of control measures, um, providing post-exposure prophylaxis, and providing health education to the community to enhance our prevention and disease control efforts. It also includes maintaining communication between public health entities, um, private providers, hospitals, and occupational infection control personnel. And we also have 24 hours, seven days a week, communicable disease response and reporting information for healthcare providers. And my colleague Renee Williams will give you an update on the STD program goals. Thank you. I'm going to review Pitt County's STD program goals, which are as follows. To monitor the STD rates and trends in Pitt County, ensure adequate treatment is given to all patients that are seen in Pitt County by private and public medical providers, also timely reporting to the state CDC branch using the North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System, also to include Maintaining, I don't know if I just went back, sorry. Okay. The STD program services that are provided at Pitt County Health Department include confidential STD exams, testing, treatment, counseling, and referral for treatment as indicated. This pie chart represents our STD case counts for the 2017 year. And as you see, our numbers are all listed. And in the breakdown, most notably, the chlamydia does account for 67%. And if you're adding in the gonorrhea cases along with that, that does take up 89% of Pitt County's STD case counts. This next graph breaks down the demographic distribution. Females make up 78% of the population being seen males at 22 percent. The race and ethnicity are further broken down and are listed as follows. Looking at our chlamydia rates from the 2016 to the 2017, we are still seeing this trend of going upward, increasing in case counts. The same can be seen with our gonorrhea rates. That increased from 664 cases to 686 cases in 2017. HIV and syphilis service. Um, Pitt County Health Department provides syphilis and HIV counseling follow-up and referral. Investigation of disease control measure violations 
along with syphilis and HIV partner notification services. Looking at the HIV rates, we have had increase. Um, looking at 2016 to 2017, from 33 up to 38. That same increase can be seen along with our AIDS reporting cases from 15 to 21 cases in 2017. Looking at our syphilis rates, they are trending downward for the 2017 year, although we're uncertain if this could be re, um, linked to the different um, definitions on the reporting. So that could be one of the issues with that. Thank you. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up is Jessica Hardy. Good evening. I'm Jessica Hardy. I'm the communicable disease nurse for the health department. And I'm just going to go over some numbers for the communicable disease program that I head up. Um, so the following diseases require the most of my time, uh, mainly the food and board diseases, just because of the amount of questions that we ask, um, such as Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter. Um, we also investigate bloodborne diseases like hepatitis B, C, and of course hepatitis A, which is a included in the foodborne diseases and vector-borne diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease. The first set of numbers I'd like to go over is for hepatitis B. We didn't have any acute cases of hepatitis B, but we did have 10 new chronic cases, which could just mean that they have had it for a long time and we just found out about it or they just were diagnosed. Um, but we also did have 26 cases that were previously reported in previous years that I had to do additional follow-up on. The next one is hepatitis C. We did have two acute cases of hepatitis C um, and 46 chronic cases that were reported. For Campylobacter, we had 10 probable cases and 8 confirmed cases. For Salmonella, we had six probable cases and 14 confirmed cases, which is our most prominent foodborne disease that we saw. For Shigella, we had zero suspect cases and three confirmed cases. For Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we had 10 probable cases, no confirmed cases just because of the case definition and how it has to meet certain requirements. But I did have 18 additional cases that I investigated and determined to not meet case definition. And Lyme disease, we had 17 suspect cases, just because, again, of the lab requirements that the state puts forth for the case definition. It says confirmed. It says confirmed. Oh, it should be backwards, sorry. No. And one confirmed case. <laughs> so it should be opposite. Sorry about that. I feel better already. <laughs> <laughs> and I also had eight additional cases of Lyme disease that I investigated and were determined to not meet case definition. Ehrlichiosis, we had one probable case or suspect case and no confirmed cases. And this just goes over a list of all the other um, communicable diseases that I went into in the year 2017. Hepatitis A, we had our one confirmed case, which was a doozy. Um, and then we also had two that did not meet case definition. We had five Haemophilus influenza cases, 13 group A strep cases, four Legionella cases, one Cryptosporidium case, one confirmed case of dengue, one probable case of Vibrio, eight adult flu deaths, and one pediatric death which is probably on the next one, yeah. Um, we had nine pertussis cases that did not meet case definition, one confirmed, one chikungunya case that did not meet case definition, two probable cases of West Nile virus, one confirmed toxic shock syndrome case, and one probable scombroid poisoning case. We did meet 100% of our communicable disease program benchmarks in 2017, which I wasn't aware of until this, so. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to, well, no. I have a question. Sure. What's the difference between chronic and acute? 
I'm just a simple engineer. For which one? Well, the, at the beginning, you have had a number of cases of various things, and it said acute cases of of certain things, and then chronic, as though chronic's not as bad as acute. And I don't understand the difference. Like I said, I'm just a simple engineer. You're fine. <laughs> um, so hepatitis B, for acute cases, that means they were exposed in the last six months, most likely. Um, so they have the elevated liver enzymes. They have the symptoms of having hepatitis. Um, it just basically means that their body was introduced to it sooner. Chronic cases means that they've had it probably for a long time, and their body has kind of just kind of put it dormant almost. They still have it but they're not showing any symptoms. Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Lee. Yeah, just uh, as you mentioned, Jessica, Hep B and Hep C both, uh, the overwhelming percentage of cases we see are, are chronic of mostly un unknown duration. So, And a lot of times they just get picked up on a, on a blood test or uh, as part of a screen or something. So. Yeah, and we've run into the... They have other things going on that makes their liver enzymes go up and stuff like that. Very good. Anybody have any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Just while Lee's getting ready, Mr. Chairman, I would comment that um, we are had a recent outbreak of hepatitis A in Mecklenburg County. Uh, this year, and we're looking at other states around the country that are having significant outbreaks of hepatitis A, and that's one of the big concerns that we have, and we're trying to get our staff ready to respond to those. Those are very difficult outbreaks to handle, uh, but uh, California, Kentucky, I think, has gone from about an average of 30 cases a year to over a 1,000 cases this year, and uh, it's being associated with uh, IV drug use, uh, men who have sex with men and homelessness, but the recent outbreak in uh, Charlotte area was was food related. But there seems to be some uh, some attachment with the homeless population there too. I think so. Uh, that's that's on our radar. Uh, although our numbers aren't there yet, uh, we, that's an area we're trying to get ready to respond to because we think it's coming pretty soon. Okay, Lee. My name's Lee Draper. I'm the immunization coordinator at the health department. Our immunization program goal is to eliminate vaccine preventable diseases in North Carolina, reduce the spread of vaccine preventable diseases, childhood diseases, by ensuring that the children are age appropriately immunized. We, one of our goals is to manage outbreaks of the vaccine preventable diseases and to provide health education to the community to improve immunization rates and protect the young ones by cocooning. And not only the young ones, all ages. Pitt County Public Health Department provides immunizations at no cost to VFC, which stands for Vaccine for Children, to those eligible kids. Immunizations for adults, the costs vary. Um, we accept Blue Cross Blue Shield, MedCost, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis for rabies, and we have the NCIR, which is the North Carolina Immunization Registry that we log all of our immunizations to into in real time. Our immunization program compliance rate is the percentage of children who have documentation of being up to date by the time they turn 24 months of age with the 19 recommended doses of vaccine. Our immunization program benchmarks, our goal for the health department is broken down between the health department and for the county. Uh, it was 90% and Pitts was 78%. We met our goal at 98%, and Pitts was at 73%. Statewide wide average is 85% in the health departments and 72 for the counties, and Healthy People 2020 goal is 80% at the health department and for the county. Next up is Lee Cutler for tuberculosis. All right, 
I'm Lee, again, the tuberculosis coordinator as well. Um, so our main goal for tuberculosis is simple. It's to eliminate tuberculosis disease as a public health threat. Um, and to do this, we want to reduce the number of new cases of tuberculosis and to control the spread of tuberculosis into the general population. Our program services that we offer um, are TB surveillance, case and contact investigations, and doing direct observed therapy, um, treatment of contacts, and providing isolation and other control measures of TB if so needed. For 2017, we had a total of 43 latent TB cases. We had a total of two cases, new two active TB cases for Pitt County, um, which put us at working a total of five active TB cases, which had rolled over from 2016 into 2017 that finished up in 2017. And uh, for our 2017 program assessment, we did meet 99.77% of our program benchmarks. So in summary, for the communicable disease program, some of the factors that impact the effectiveness of our communicable disease program is the ease of access to quality health care, the timely access to quality health care, having increased community awareness and education regarding our existing and potential health threats, and then having uh, good community partner collaborations. And so for the focus, you can see back, going back to 2013, a lot of our focus has been having improvement um, with our access to care and going up to now. So last year, as well as moving forward, we're also wanting to increase our efficiency of our clinic services uh, to our clients. And we also want to improve our outreach efforts for prevention and early treatment of diseases for um, the residents of Pitt County. This is just a lift, listing of our communicable disease program staff. Any other questions for our staff? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back. Let's see. <clears throat> Time for Pitt County Partners for Health. We're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about Pit Partners for Health. Has everybody here heard of Pit Partners for Health? Thank you, Dr. Mara. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my name is Stephanie Cabinets, and I'm the coordinator for Pit Partners for Health. We have three priority areas and three action teams that carry out that work. Our first action, well, let me tell you the priority areas. They are chronic disease, uh, nutrition and physical activity, and access to care. The first one we'll talk about is chronic disease. The chronic disease action team, um, an important initiative for them is the community-centered health home and otherwise known as the West Greenville Health Initiative. In 2014, um, a Blue Cross and Blue Shield planning grant was given to the health department and the chronic disease and access to care teams had conversations with community residents and organizational leaders about what they felt was important in their community. They had interviews literally on the street, they had listening sessions, and they held focus groups. From that information, they decided to hold a community forum. Now with the forum, it was a group of community members and also agency people, but they came together to decide for them, for their town, or their area, I should say, what the priorities were. And what came out of that community forum was mental health and depression, <laughs> diabetes, bloodborne diseases, substance abuse, cancer, and teen pregnancy. Now also from that forum came the formation of what is now called the West Greenville Health Council. 2014, they do the planning grant and they, they start all this work and currently in 2018, um, they're holding monthly steering meetings, which is kind of like a planning group, and monthly general meetings. 
They've implemented two interventions, also the evidence-based interventions. One's called WalkWise NC, and one is Minority Diabetes Prevention Program. Pitt Partners is working with the West Greenville Health Council, and we're providing health education sessions at meetings and serving as content content experts, and also provided something called Cooking Matters at the Store and the pop-up tours. Cooking Matters at the Store is literally a grocery store tour where people go into the grocery store. For, it's a two-hour period. It is led by a nutritionist, and they learn about what is healthy and what is not healthy and how to budget and, and provide good foods for low cost. Now, the pop-up tours, they are basically the same thing, but for people who cannot attend the two-hour tours, the pop-up is basically the grocery store going to them. So it's out of a the box. They're still learning about what's nutritious and also how to cook on a budget. Oh, I hit the wrong thing. Okay. All right. Again, thank you, Dr. Morrow. Um, this was the West Greenville Health Council. They had a block party, and it was just held last week. Um, they had about 100 community members. They had food, games, health screenings, and more. So you can see the progression of what has happened from that planning grant. They are now looking at other grants and other funding for other initiatives. All right, so the second team is um, the physical activity and nutrition team. And some of their initiatives include what I just told you about, the Cooking Matters at the Store Tours. In 2017, which is in your SOTS report, um, they had 12 tours and over 100 participants. I was able to go to one of those, and it, it is a learning experience. Um, they also had a $10 grocery gift card at the end so that people were kind of given a challenge to shop on that $10, stuff that is healthy. Um, for the pop-up tours, they had several of those, including the West Greenville Health Council. Um, also, for nutrition and physical activity, they provided samples of local produce donated by farmers. They had 16 healthy cooking demonstrations on Saturday mornings between May and August in 17, and gave out over 2,900 food samples. There's also a pres food preservation group, which provided five educational events at the farmer's market during the summer, and they talked about freezing, canning, and decreasing food waste. Physical Activity and Nutrition is working with the Chronic Disease Action Team to promote track trails. Have you all heard of track trails in Pitt County? Anybody heard of track trails? No? Okay. Good opportunity for me. Um, it is not where we are building trails, but it is an overlay to an existing trail. And currently in Pitt County, we have two, one at Alice Keene Park and one at River Park North. These overlays are designed to incentivize um, children and children of all ages to come out to the park to you know get off their devices to look into nature to learn about bugs and trees and things like that so in Pitt County there are currently two and in 2000 well from 2016 to 2017 utilization of those trails increased 267 percent so that's pretty significant in 2018, you'll be learning about this in next year's SOTS report, two more track trails will be added, and one will be in Fountain, and one will be in Grifton. Also with the chronic disease team, this is along the lines with track trails, but it's called Track RX, and this is where we partner with local pediatrician offices to have them write prescriptions for these activities. So in 2017, there were two pediatricians that were currently involved in writing these prescriptions. But now in 2018, we have five. And today from a meeting, I learned that we possibly have six. So that's exciting too. Other initiatives to promote healthy lifestyles are the monthly early morning segment on WITN, promoting family-friendly family health initiatives, events, recipes, and more. We also created a speakers bureau of health professionals, and that was created because a lot of community members want people to come out who are knowledgeable, and this way we have the bureau that we can pull from in different content areas, like nutrition or activity. Um, another initiative is Winning with Diabetes. This is a yearly conference that's held in November. Last November, there was 100 participants, and they had a healthy lunch, health screenings, and interactive stations. 
Another program is active routes to school. Um, the programs have impacted in 2017 over a thousand students. Just alone with their walk at school and walk across America, they serve 400 students. And with all these initiatives, we really are working to help make the healthy choice the easy choice. Our third team is access to care. And, um, and I didn't share with you who the co-chairs were before, so I'm gonna go ahead and share these. Uh, Ron Gaskins, he is president of Access East, and Mary Hall, she's with Senior Services from Vident. One of the initiatives and an important program for our community is called the Community Paramedic. It's a collaboration between Vidant Medical Center, Pitt County Emergency Management, and Vidant Health. The goal is to provide care in the community so that we can decrease the number of unnecessary ED visits. And currently, the paramedic has a caseload of 20 patients. And I'm gonna kinda circle back to this and give you a success story. Um, in a minute. Other services include counseling um, provided to seniors to assist with Medicare Part D enrollment, assistance with applications to social services for the low income energy assistance program, and with access to care, we are still focusing on transportation issues because that is an issue in Pitt County. Um, we're looking at ride share options and things like that, but in doing the community health needs assessment this go around, what we're hearing a lot of is that people would really like the services coming to them. So mobile services as well, which the community paramedic really does speak to. All right, so those were our three action teams around our three priority areas. But I also want to share a grant that Pitt Partners received in 2016. It's called Healthy People, Healthy, Healthy Carolinas. It's a Duke Endowment grant. And it, is, um, it was for $450,000 for three years to enhance Pitt Partners for Health, the coalition, and to implement these evidence-based interventions around physical activity, nutrition, and chronic disease prevention. Our first EBI, or evidence-based intervention, was WalkWise NC, which is a walking program that also promotes social support. And while people are walking in the community, they get to look at the environment that they have and let us know what issues are there. Lighting, um, sidewalk issues, shrubbery that's grown up, things like that to make it safer in the community. This year we added walk with a doc, cooking matters at the store, catch, which is coordinated approach to child health, kids in parks, track trails, the Arthritis Foundation exercise program, and we are investigating others for the coming year. And I think this speaks to some of the social determinants of health as well. So now I'm gonna ask you to join us. Pitt Partners meets every month except for July, second Thursday at 8.30 to 10 o'clock, and we meet at various locations in the county. You have any questions? Are those locations uh, posted online or do you need to call the, the number you have posted? You can call me and I can send you the, the schedule for the year. Okay. And you can check us out on Facebook as well. Very good. Does anybody have any questions for Stephanie? All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening. I'm Kayla Hall. Yes. I'm the director of the Community Benefit Grants Program with Vidant Health. And um, it is a partnership between Vidant Health and our community. Uh, the programs that we fund take place outside of the hospital walls. They're uh, designed to prevent um, disease and also to teach people techniques to self-manage disease. Uh, it also increases access to care for uninsured and the underinsured, and we like to locate programs and make them more accessible by removing transportation and financial barriers. Provide grants to nonprofit, 501c3 organizations, and public entities. And when I talk about public entities, I'm talking about uh, public schools, health departments, city and county governments. And um, we like to ask community what their ideas are to improve health. We find sometimes when we go in and say, point fingers and say, you should be doing this or you shouldn't be doing that, that doesn't always go real well. We kind of like to ask them what would they, what do they think would help and what what solutions they think would be successful in their community. Whoops. Okay. 
Uh, Vita Health's commitment, uh, we just now, in July, this last month, we entered our 20th year of distributing funds, a $1 million uh, commitment annually. So we've distributed over $20 million and uh, to over uh, 760 grants. And we have a 700,000 commitment annually to the regional grants program. And we're in the 13th year of distributing funds in the region. And we will be having a celebration and we will be sending you all a uh, invitation to come to that. And that will be October the 23rd, but we'll be sending you invitations so you can come and just kind of see what's happening here um, as well as you know out in the region. Our focus and priority areas are the same as Vidant Medical Center, Vidant Health, and Pitt Partners for Health. There are access to care, which includes physical health, mental health, or dental health, nutrition and physical activity, and chronic disease prevention and management, um, programs that address cancer, diabetes, stroke, and we also have some programs that, you know, uh, focus on sickle cell and also autism. And our focus areas are based on the information from community health needs assessment. In the area of access to care, we supported three grants that provide direct access to primary care providers. One grant was for a partial salary for physician at the Bernstein Center, and we supported two grants that provide support to two free clinics, Pitt County Care, which is held at the health department every Sunday, and Oakmont Medical Clinic, which is the second and fourth Tuesdays. Uh, collectively, these programs served approximately uh, 5,000 people. And then we also like to talk about the investments, not just grants, but it, we see it as investment as well. So we have an investment of 85,000 in three medication assistance programs, resulted in 750 patients receiving over 4,800 prescriptions valued at more than $4.1 million, almost $4.2 million. 824 individuals received over-the-counter meds valued at greater than $83,000. We had an investment of $33,000 with Pitt County Council on Aging for Medicare Insurance Options Counselor. And I'm approaching that age where I'm going to need some of that counseling as well. But if, from what I understand, it's very difficult to try to navigate some of the, some of the terminology and some of the paperwork. So this program helps a lot of folks. Um, 19, over 1,900 counseling sessions resulted in a cost savings of greater than 1.5 million to area seniors. Another area in access to care is mental health counseling. Supported three grants that provided 387 adult counseling sessions, 94 children's counseling sessions, and 184 family counseling sessions. And these were to care net counseling, to um, Building Hope, Visions of Hope program, and to the Center for Family Violence Prevention. When we think of access to care, a lot of times we do think about a doctor's copay or medications, but there's also ex access in and out of your own home. You can be affected within your own home being able to move around and getting in and out of your home to get to a doctor's office or to get to grocery store or get prescriptions picked up. We had an investment of 22,502 grants that provided in-home assessments for safety and health concerns. Those two agencies were the Pitt County Council on Agents, Pitt County Council on Aging and Rebuilding Together Pitt County. 140 individuals received interior and exterior home improvements. The average cost of $160 per person is small in comparison to being housed in assisted living at approximately 36,000 per year or in a nursing home at approximately 79,000 per year. An investment of 17,500 for two programs providing 85 people with ramps. We have two organizations that provide the ramps, Jarvis Shepherds Helpers Group, they provide temporary um, portable ramps and they have a I guess you would say a a stock that they they can use to rotate as people need those. Um, it's meant to be temporary anywhere from a, a year or, or less. And then the permanent ramps are wooden ramps that are provided by Oakmont. The cost savings to these families is estimated over $200,000. In the area of nutrition physical activity, we fund nutrition education programs, food security, and we uh, grants that improve access to healthier foods. In the area of food security, 1.2 million pounds of nutritious food and fresh produce was distributed through 11 mobile food pantry sites in Pitt County, and that was in partnership with the Food Bank of Central and Eastern Carolina. Uh, we 
did a grant, sorry, we issued a grant to Community Crossroads where that provided 18,322 breakfast meals that were served to 539 residents at the homeless shelter. And 172 people received a monthly supplemental diabetic friendly food box from Firstborn Community Development Center. They have a uh, monthly food distribution for um, regular population and one for a diabetic food distribution, and that's the one that we support. They go in and they participate in the armchair exercise class. The idea is for them to take that home and hopefully be doing those exercises at home. And they also participate in some nutrition education or healthy recipe demonstration. Once that is complete, then they can get their food box and, and take it home with them. And those boxes can, you know, contain things with, with whole wheat, um, some, I would say, lean protein, skim milk, and artificial sweeteners. We had supported a new food co-op program with Hope of Glory Ministries. It was started and that enabled 22 families to save money on their monthly grocery bill. The way it works is they pay a monthly fee. Anywhere from $50 to $75 is just, a, just an amount that I'm you know, using as an example, but it's based on their income and how many people are in their family. Uh, they, however, for that amount, they probably get around $200 to $250 worth of groceries. They meet with a counselor, a financial mentor, that sits down with them to help them decide what are some of the financial areas that they need to improve in. And so they set and meet their financial goals, such as paying off debts, establishing emergency funds, and savings accounts. And in return, they also provide community service you know, to help staff the food co-op. In the area of nutrition education, uh, grants increased access to nutrition education for children through in-school programs in North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Uh, we also partnered with the Pitt County Schools to provide funding for a registered dietitian. They pay half the salary, we pay the other half. And this ensures the health and safety of children with special diets. There are over 850 children in Pitt County Schools with special diets. This could be gluten allergies, it could be peanut allergies, any number of things that these children um, might have special diet needs for. Uh, the dietitian also provided training to the cafeteria managers and food service workers about the special diets and about um, cross-contamination. Physical activity, children had increased access to nutrition education physical activity during after school programs in Aden, Farmville, Greenville, Robertsonville, and Snow Hill. Uh, many of these are boys and girls clubs, but there are also some programs that are not boys and girls clubs that are supported here. A grant supported physical activities for children and adults with physical disabilities through year round adapted recreation events. Um, I think in the next week and a half, I think there is a adapted water day where they've got some different um, I guess adapted sports for um, skiing and just different things that they can participate on the water and I think that's going to take place within the next um, two weeks. Uh, we also partnered with the Christopher Reeves Foundation where our foundation and Christopher Reeves gave grants to the Greenville Recreation and Parks Department for paramobile units. These units enable individuals who can no longer stand to stand and do things like golf, um, to fish, you get the batting cages, and we partnered and we did two of these paramobile units because we thought it would be better for them to be able to, you know, along with others, but be able to participate in activities together. And it means quite a bit. We have an annual meeting where we have folks come in and share the successes of their programs, and the young man who just talked about, he had been very active uh, prior to an accident that he had, and he's able now to, you know, do things with adapted water skiing and different activities, and it just means so much to him, and this was meant a lot to him to, to stand again. Oops. In the area of chronic disease prevention and management, a grant to Picasso supported HIV AIDS awareness and education. Funds were also used to purchase the rapid HIV t test kits. Uh, we awarded funding to the Pitt County Health Department for diabetes self-management classes. 175 persons um, benefited from one-on-one -on -one and group education sessions, and community awareness and outreach activities served over 850 people in the community. Provided funding to access these for colon cancer screenings, and six out of the 20 that were screened presented with precancerous polyps that were able to be removed at that time. A grant with the ECU helps to support a portion of a nurse's salary at sickle cell clinic. 
Patients in pain crisis can seek relief in the clinic, and it also enables them to avoid an ED visit or hospitalization if their pain can be controlled or managed. This is a win-win for the patients because it's my understanding that oftentimes when they do have a hospital visit, it could be three to five days, and they would much rather be at home than be in the hospital. ACEs for Autism provided applied behavioral analysis therapy to 16 children. Prior to the ABA therapy, parents reported that only 50% of activities occurred without problem behavior, but following the ABA therapy, parents reported 82% of activities now occur without problem behavior. So that's a pretty good increase, and it's important for their quality of life as a family to be able to go to the grocery store and to have social activities with family and friends and, and school activities. And then I um, shared some numbers with you this evening that demonstrate the success of grants that are funded. And in some instances, we shared the number of people or meals served. In other instances, we shared the dollars invested and demonstrated returns and cost savings to some of our most vulnerable community members. However, we always request that as part of the reporting process that our grantees share personal, personal success stories of the work that's being done. While I know presentation has taken some time, I'd like for us to be able to personalize what all these programs mean to individuals that are recipients of these services. And I'm really taking this from someone else's report. So if you hear me say we, it's their organization that, that's we. Um, medication assistance, collaboration between two grants with Access East and NC Med Assist. Patient A did not have any form of health insurance, had a bad case of asthma, and could not afford his inhalers every month. The patient had to choose between being able to purchase food or his medications. The medication assistant specialist with Access East enrolled him in Health Assist, received prescriptions from his provider, and then went through the process of helping him get prescriptions from NC Med Assist. The patient now receives his inhalers and medications every three months, and he calls each month to tell us what a difference we've made in his life. Before we helped him, he was considered a frequent user of the emergency department, and he went there just to get his respiratory treatments. Patient B lost her health insurance due to being laid off. Her medication costs were extremely high due to the number of medications prescribed to her. Without a dependable support system, she went without her medications and had multiple hospital visits. Our medication assistance team was contacted by the emergency department and asked if we could come over and enroll her in health assist so, and to assist with medications that she needs. We were able to get many of the medications she needed from NC Med Assist and the others we were able to get from a pharmaceutical patient assistance program. She is now taking her medications as she should and called to let us know when her medications arrived in the mail. She is so thankful that we were able to help her and she tells everyone about us. She is a pleasure to work with and she is now on the road of trying to find a job and hopefully get some health insurance. And then for the colon cancer screening program, an uninsured patient in their early 30s was referred to Pitt County Health Department for a colonoscopy. The individual did not have a primary care provider, and she was anxious and worried about having the procedure, especially since five close relatives had been diagnosed with colon cancer at a young age. A colonoscopy was scheduled and performed with no polyps discovered. The patient was more than relieved with the outcome and very grateful to be able to access a resource which enabled them to have a colonoscopy. As mentioned earlier, six out of 20 of people who received the colonoscopies had polyps that had to be removed. However, there is the other side of the coin where individuals don't have polyps but can be given peace of mind that everything is okay. And then finally, I keep, I've got some four examples to talk about as far as with the ramp building. Um, one family's loved one was diagnosed with ALS. Having the ramp allowed much easier access into and out of the home. This family wrote extensively on Facebook about how the ramp allowed for the increased freedom of movement for their family member. Another example is a teenage son whose mother needed a ramp. He asked if he could help build the ramp for his mother. He worked all day to help build that ramp and then went back the second day to help build a ramp for someone he didn't even know because he was so grateful. And thirdly, um, they cite a situation of building a ramp for an elementary school child with multiple health needs. This took place a week after the unexpected death of the child's father, who was likely the person who had the strength to help get the child in and out of their home. We were able to help this family in their grief. When we completed the ramp, they were able to experience some joy and relief with the celebration of the child's <coughs> increased mobility in and out of the home at such a difficult time that it was kind of bittersweet for them. 
And the last one, building a ramp for a paraplegic woman who could only leave her house when neighbors would come to lift her wheelchair down the steps. As we completed each section of her ramp, she would wheel herself out of the house and touch each section as she moved about freely without assistance. She was, bleeming, she was beaming and blessed us as we worked. And then they continued, this is the last part, in, in their words, we continue to be blessed as a ministry team to share with the families the excitement and joy of an ambulatory challenged individual who goes down the ramp the first time after its completion. The relief this brings to families who no longer need to pick up a wheelchair or lift an individual to the ground so that they can leave their homes to get to a medical appointment or to ride in a car or to just sit outside in the yard is immeasurable. Thank you. Do you have any questions about any of the programs? Okay. Very good. Thank you very much for your report. <clears throat> so you're going to give us a wrap up, Amy? Yes, sir. Right. But before I go into next steps, I, I did want to um, acknowledge our Office of Public Information um, under the direction of Mike Emery and his staff, um, Kyle Kettler and Carla Hansen. Without their um, ability, um, to make our programs visible, you know, whether it's on Pitt TV or um, the newspaper or um, any way that they can get our messages out. Um, they always help us to do that and make us, you know, look good and connect us with the community. I also want to especially thank uh, Carla Hansen because Carla designed uh, the look of the 2017 State of the County Health Report. So I wanted to publicly thank um, all three of those um, members of the Office of Public Information. So on to next steps. Um, the next thing we'll do, we will continue to meet the goals of the current Community Health Needs Assessment Health Priorities, the ones that have been presented to you tonight. Um, we are now working on the 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment. We have conducted community focus groups, community opinion surveys in preparation for the 2019 assessment. You'll hear more about that in the fall. Um, so we will present the uh, data findings from those recent surveys and the groups to the Board of Health, Pitt Partners for Health, as well as the VITIT Board in late fall. And then new priority areas um, will be selected in the late fall or early winter. I mean, they may stay the same. That will be um, based on the data that's presented to you and what you decide um, that we need to be working on for the next three years. And then the 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment will be submitted to the state in March of 2019, and then upon approval, it will be published on our website and copies made available in various venues in the community. So um, how people can get involved? Well, here's my contact information. They can contact me directly at the health department. My phone number's here, email address, and as Stephanie Cabanis had mentioned earlier, inviting you to join Pitt Partners for Health. Um, any members of the community that would be interested in doing that would be able to have a say in the selection of priority areas that Pitt Partners will be working on, um, as well as the Health Department. And that concludes our presentation. I would like to um, ask at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, if the Board could approve the State of the County Health Report 2017 report as well as the Annual Communicable Disease Report. Okay. <clears throat> Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, we're approved. Thank you very much aye. for your uh, leadership and each of you for your pre both your leadership and your presentations tonight. It's an excellent way to inform the public about all the good work that's being done. So Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> okay, next on the agenda, the National Association of Local Boards of Health meeting in Raleigh. And, uh, well, I went to that. I know it's kind of late. I'll just be brief. Um, I, it was a great meeting. I appreciate um, that uh, Dr. Morrill helped me to get a scholarship so that I could go to that. Um, listening to this report tonight, I can't believe how much the two meetings dovetailed. Um, I think if I had to pick three um, words that they talked about at that meeting was were communication, collaboration, and planning and that really public health can't um, just operate by themselves and it's great to see we have so many um, partners. One of the talks I liked um, the best that I thought was so interesting was about messaging in public health and that was given by um, someone from Chapel Hill but also a Baptist minister and talked about how public health 
could, is really very, has quite a bit um, in common with faith-based um, communities, but doesn't always um, get that message across. And it was interesting to hear about how um, I was listening to the RAMP program and that, and how that really has involved um, faith-based communities. Um, I did also um, thought it was quite interesting, two of the things that were mentioned tonight. Um, we had a report from the executive director of the Association of State and Territorial Boards of Health, which is a, um, um, a partner. Um, what was interesting is he, um, he, he couldn't make it. His plane got delayed in D.C., so we, had, we saw him on TV. But um, he really felt there was bipartisan support for home visitation programs, which I thought is something that um, certainly comes up here with our nurse family partnership. And one of the uh, subgroups I went to that I thought was really interesting was uh, um, this idea of toxic shock that happens to infants that, and young children where they're um, repeatedly exposed to violence and trauma when they're just so young that they don't even realize they're in a bad environment. And not only is it a bad environment, but it changes their brain. And he had all these MRIs and things that, that it changes their ability to control um, impulses and to process information. And so they become um, quite disadvantaged in uh, dealing with future problems. So he, his point was that the, the child is too early, is too young to realize that they've got a problem. So buffer programs like nurse uh, family partnership that actually help the mother or someone in the environment to be a buffer against this stress are critical. And then the uh, other thing he thought there was bipartisan support for was the whole o opioid epidemic. And again, it was interesting how um, what we've recently done in uh, Pitt County with the needle exchange program, he said it's not just about communicable disease, but that seems to be a window of opportunity for reaching pregnant women because they are, um, they several of them um, expressed that they had, um, um, it was kind of a moment of change for these women and they came in and that they had several examples of um, infants that didn't have to go to the NICU, could be, could be managed, which in itself would pay for that kind of a program. Um, the other big issue that I thought was kind of a, a concern is evidently there's an executive order that has called for reorganization of um, the executive branch of government at the national level which to determine which services can be sent to the state. And there was a lot of concern about that. You probably are aware of that somewhat, Dr. Morrow. 45%, uh, 50%, they said, of a state's um, health budget is federally funded programs. And so that would be a terrific um, uh, burden on the states to be able it, for that to happen. Um, I, there were a lot of breakout sessions. I won't go into that, but um, they had topics about um, environmental health, um, increase in school nurse um, ratio to help um, especially kids that are experiencing a lot of these um, uh, mental health problems, and um, also the public health workforce. There was a very, um, uh, it was a national survey about the public health workforce and the satisfaction of uh, public people working in public health and the, um, the idea of the millennial workforce, which is that you can't expect, a, the takeaway message to me was you, it's very unlikely you'll get a millennial to work for more than two years for your organization, unlike old people like me that worked for my organization for over 30 years. So, um, but what they really said millennials value are things like career programs and um, um, opportunities for advancement and that the public sector hasn't really done as well with that as the private sector has kind of caught on to things like flexible work schedules and um, advancement programs within the organization to try to um, retain people. So it was, it was a great conference. I have um, the slides and all of the, if anybody's interested, um, I really, 
Um, I was going to read just this one, I abbreviated, but the, the, the man who was the Baptist minister, he wanted to give this advice to public health people. And since we have so many public health people, I'll um, read, read it just briefly. But he said um, he called public health um, a sanctified calling, similar, and I'm not Baptist, so this is not a, this is not a promotion. But um, he, I thought it was very moving. He called it a sanctified calling. He said, my counsel to our beloved field of public health is that we must continue to talk about facts, analytics, determinants, vectors, patterns, and predictors. But we must also talk about our love of the public in the broadest terms. You can take our money, put us in the dumpiest office, and cut our staff. We don't want that, but um, you can relocate our building to a place so far down the road you can't find it in broad daylight. You can treat us as pitiful, but we won't quit. If you are a public health professional and uh, who does not profess love for the public, I'd recommend that you take your high-end analytic tools and move on down the street to do hedge fund manipulation because you're a danger to the public and the rest of us in the field of public health who won't quit. So that was what I, that was my takeaway message. Amen. Amen. That's what I said. Uh, very good. Does anybody have any questions for Martha? Well, thank you very much for attending and bringing back the uh, report. It was good. It's in Denver next year, if anybody else. Yeah, that was, that was in Raleigh. That, that was so in was Raleigh, close so by. it was in Sure, not tomorrow we get you a grant to go there. Next. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Huh? Uh, okay, health director's report for tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Engelke, for attending that. I, I, and again, if if any of the Board of Health uh, would like to attend future meetings, we'll sure try to make that happen, and whether that's in Denver or wherever it is, because um, I think it's 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 a it is a, a good meeting, and and uh, it's important for our our boards of health to be strong uh, and I think y'all know we have a good one here but we want to make sure it stays that way. So just a few things Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I did uh, pass out a, a handout on Medicaid reform that uh, the, the State uh, Department of Health and Human Services has recently released a request for proposal uh, to the insurance companies, other prepaid health plans. Uh, they're accepting proposals <laughs> until October the 12th. Of uh, this year, and then they will start a two-phased um, start across the state in July of next year that will run between July of next year and February of 2020 uh, across the six defined state regions. So uh, we'll stand by and see how that progresses, but we're uh, actively getting ready for that Medicaid reform. Uh, Marsha Hall talked a little bit about our, our Medicaid cost settlement. We know that's uh, scheduled to change with this reform, and so we've got a lot of work to do in that regard, as well as just making sure that we're taking care of the patients, uh, Medicaid patients. Um, Amy mentioned the, the accreditation that's approaching. Our uh, accreditation is coming up uh, for 2019. We just recently received our 90-day letter uh, that's uh, our deadline to collect the uh, evidence that we have to turn in before our site visit um, probably in March, Amy, is that right? So a uh, lot of work going on around that. I uh, also did want to take a minute just to thank the uh, Smith Family Foundation and Dr. Uh, uh, Rob Doherty and his staff at the Bernstein Center for helping us to keep the Smile Safari Dental Unit operating. Uh, at our, all of our elementary schools here in the county. Uh, the Smith Family Foundation uh, just recently gave us a $30,000 grant to update the equipment on that 18-year-old dental unit. So we hope to have that out um, to all the elementary schools uh, as soon as school gets started. Probably be after Labor Day before that happens. And just uh, mention August uh, is uh, World Breastfeeding Month, so we want to uh, help celebrate that with the promotion of breastfeeding, breastfeeding uh, across the county. Our uh, our school uh, is getting re schools are getting ready to start. That means kindergarten physicals and kindergarten immunizations are due. And uh, just got a report today on our immunization rates in Pitt County. Uh, last year, we're doing 
I would say very well with uh, about 4.6%, 4 it looks like, of Pitt County uh, kindergartners uh, had not obtained their immunization requirements within 30 calendar days of first attendance. So um, we'd like to see it lower, but that's not too bad. So I think we're, we're doing pretty good. And, and Lee Draper, the data that she shared with you in terms of, of our us meeting our immunization goals, we're doing extremely well at the health department at about 98, 99%. Uh, the county is not so good. So we've, we've got to get our private providers uh, improved in those regards. And the last thing is uh, strategic planning. Again, that uh, looks like we'll be doing that uh, in November. So we've got a couple of more months before we get ready for that strategic planning session with the board. And that's it. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Morrow? <clears throat> okay, hearing none. Is there any other business for tonight? Okay, again, hearing none. Thank you all again very much for your reports tonight. Uh, certainly, if uh, any of the public listening, if you have follow up questions about any of these reports tonight, uh, certainly uh, don't hesitate to call the health department. The uh, phone number was on uh, just about every slide, but Again, it's 252-902-2300, so uh, don't hesitate to uh, call with questions about any of these reports, or, or, or if you have suggestions, uh, as well as the citizen input that uh, Shayla Hayes was uh, requesting. So, uh, any, other, any other questions, comments? If not, is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. A second? second. All, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.